Great. Thank you. Uh, so again, thank you guys for taking the time out of your day to, to meet with me today. Uh, today's presentation, we're actually going to talk about calculating connection design forces in SRAM. Uh, and for those of you that don't know me, my name is Matt. I'm a structural engineer at SRAM Software in Vancouver. Um, and I've done different sessions for uh, the Steel Squad before. Uh, you guys have visited our office back in the days when we were still able to do that. And uh, we've done other presentations for U of A and so on. So some of you may recognize the name or perhaps the voice. Um, I do a lot of the training as well. This is going to be a relatively short presentation. Uh, we're kind of focusing in on uh, one specific topic that a lot of our users maybe aren't aware of uh, its capabilities in S-Frame. But if anyone's doing steel design or uh, you know has to go through the process of connection design, it will certainly help with that. Um, so I'll just go right into it right now. Um, basically, what we would be doing within S-Frame is determining the forces that are required uh, in a connection. So we're not actually doing the design of the connection ourselves. That would be done in some sort of other platform or however you do that. But we can give you the forces that are required in your connection design uh, after you've built the model in S-Frame and so on. So if you've already got the model, the model built uh, for analysis and steel design purposes, you can take it one step further and get your connection design forces as well. And these connections, well, they can be created for you automatically. Uh, basically, S-Frame has tools that will allow you to, uh, or will allow the software to basically dictate which members are contributing to a specific connection detail or a connection group, I guess you could call it, based off the geometry, how, on what side is connecting and which direction and so on. And that can be modified by the user. The user can also choose which members uh, and basically which uh, set of N forces from a member are going to be accumulating at a connection component, uh, which could represent a lot of different things and will be used to calculate those pass-through forces. And this information could be uh, displayed graphically or numerically, depending on what it is that you need to do. So I've kind of highlighted three different topics for this presentation. First of all, just clarifying what are these pass-through or connection design forces? Uh, what, how, can we, uh, how can we choose which members are going to contribute to this type of uh, situation? And we'll look at a quick example as well. And at the end of the presentation, I'll just make a few summarizing points. And if there are any questions along the way, feel free to interrupt me. I'll do my best to answer as much as I can now. Uh, if it is something that I don't know the answer to off the top of my head, I'll note it down and follow up with you guys afterwards. So first of all, let's just make sure we're all on the same page. Uh, and we're going to define pass-through forces, at least in the context of how it's used in S-Frame. So if we have an example here where we've got a column and a brace and a beam connected to it, uh, we want to look at how we can design the connections, uh, or at least determine the forces in that uh, particular, excuse me, particular connection component. So the past two forces we're saying are the loads produced at the end of each one of these members transmitted across a joint in our structure. And that could be coming from just one member, multiple members. We might have different sides of the joint having different pass-through forces contributing. And so ultimately what we're calculating is the loads that are coming across the joint in our structure. And this is what would need to be communicated to the connection designer. And I know in some cases, the person who's designing the structure is also the connection designer. In other cases, those may be two separate groups. For the sake of this presentation, again, I just want to clarify that S-Frame can give you the forces, but we're not going to do the connection design within S-Frame. And S-Frame can give you these forces, regardless of how large your model is, how complex your model is. It doesn't really care about that. It's going to have to calculate those forces anyway, so it's just presenting it to you in a digestible format. So we can look at different ways that we might want to model this information. We have the first step I'll take you through is where we might have user-defined connection components. And this is where you, as a user of S-Frame, would specify pass-through force IDs and assign them to member ends. And basically, this is meant to 
tag members uh, that are going to be comprising a specific connection. So if you have multiple members connecting at a joint that might be part of the same connection, you can tag them with the same pass-through force ID, and those forces will be summed up and reported back to you. And if you have a specific connection type that occurs at multiple locations within your model, you can do the same thing, assigning the same pass-through force IDs to the members contributing to each one of those connections, and you'll be able to report the worst case scenario in that situation to make sure that you design your connection accordingly. So what happens then is S-Rain will accumulate the member end forces. Imagine this is, well, we've got a beam here. This beam might have some axial loads that are either pulling it or pushing it into the column. We may have some shear forces, some bending moments and so on at this connection. And we need to be able to sum that up in the orientation of the joint's coordinate system. And that may not necessarily always be the same for every single joint. And I have an example in a little bit that will show you why we might not necessarily have the same orientation for the joint's coordinate system in each situation. So I'm going to actually jump into SRAM right away here. And I've got a model. If you guys have attended uh, training from SRAM before or maybe watched some of our videos, you may have seen a variation of this model in the past. Uh, this model, I, I like to rely on it because it has pretty much everything I need to design a steel design uh, exercise, but you know it's simple enough for us to wrap our heads around. So just to maybe explain this a little bit more, we've got several different joints in the model uh, connecting to different members that represent braces, columns, beams, and so on. And we can see, if I just display my legend, that we have all of the section properties assigned. They're all steel members. And if I go to the, at the bottom of the screen here, we have the pass-through force tool. We have this pass-through force tool, and I'll just toggle this display off. This pass-through force tool allows me to see basically how we could assign those tags for pass-through force IDs. And I'm actually going to, uh, what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to toggle on the display of my joint and member numbers. And for the time being, I'll actually hide my pass-through force IDs. And let's just focus in on this one joint here at the top of the column that connects to my roof. It, the number actually of this joint overlaps with my specific um, uh, column that's underneath it, but we're just going to introduce basically which members are con connecting to it. So here at this joint, we've got a column underneath it, starting with member 14. We have a beam from the roof connecting to it, a brace from the roof connecting to it, this member number 11, another beam on the side of the structure here, member number 1, and member number 31 is a brace. So we've got a variety of different members connecting. Some of them will have different properties in terms of how they're connected to the joint. Uh, in this case here, I think they might actually all be beams uh, elements in this situation. I just want to confirm that quickly. I think that's the case. So that means that beam elements will have the ability to transfer moments. Uh, they'll have the ability to transfer shear forces, axial loads may not necessarily be realistic for some of our bracing. We could always add releases to that if we wanted to. Uh, but for the sake of this exercise, again, I'm just doing this for demonstration more than anything else. So let's just say for this example here that we want to use the pass through force ID and tag some of these members that it could be contributing to different connection details. So I'm just going to right click on, or sorry, left click on the pass through force tool. And I'll hide the display of my joint and member numbers. And here you can see within this data bar at the top of the screen, we have the ability here to select the pass-through force ID and then click on a member end to apply it to that member end. And I've actually got some already applied, so I'm just going to unhide these pass-through forces, uh, force IDs rather. And we can see here that we've actually got a few contributing members already. So I have pass-through force ID number one that's been tagged to this roof brace and this horizontal beam on the left end, basically the end is connecting to joint number one. And what this is going to do is it's going to tell S-Frame, tell me what the end forces are in this beam right here and this brace, sum them up in the orientation of the joint's coordinate system and report them back to me so that I can observe how much forces are going through that joint.
from these two members. And do the same thing for joint number two, which is being applied to this roof beam and this roof brace, but it's obviously centered around a different joint. And if we look through this model here, we can see that we actually have a few others. We've got uh, this beam here has, um, sorry, pass through force ID number three, pass through force ID number four on uh, this beam over here. And just for an example, we also did the same thing with joint number five or pass through force ID five on the end of this beam. And you can see here, it was kind of overlapping with the view. So it is this horizontal beam, not the, the short uh, cantilever that we saw. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to quickly run an analysis. I go run analysis. And on my other monitor here, I have this analysis type dialog that appears. And I'm going to run a linear static analysis for my low cases and combinations. And actually, before I go further, I want to also introduce that. So if I go to the low cases and combinations, here we've got a few different low cases. I've got a self-weight load, which I think everyone has a pretty good understanding of what that represents. We have a dead load from our roof, which are basically UDLs on our roof beams. We have snow loads, and we can see here what those represent. We have basically this uh, projected area or line load uh, on our roof. Wind loads, gelateral loads, crane loads, joint loads here, and some pressure loads on just a portion of the pad. And then also a lateral joint load uh, just for uh, experimentation here. So I'm going to go ahead and run the analysis. Again, it's a linear static analysis, so click OK. And if I drag this solver window over to the other screen here, we can see that we've ran through the all seven low cases, and we also have three low combinations that we've created. And now I can look at the results in a little bit more detail. And for those of you that may not have as much experience with S-Frame, uh, well, first of all, right now it's showing me all of my loading here for my self-weight load case, which I'm just going to hide to declutter the screen. But for those of you that aren't familiar with S-Frame, we can use this graphical results window to now view things like the deflected shapes and also the magnitudes of deflections. We can look at reaction loads. I can also look at things like member diagrams, so I can see the axial loads from self-weight in each one of these uh, members shear diagrams, and moment diagrams, among other things. But what I'm really interested in is, again, looking at these pass-through forces in a little bit more detail. So I'm just going to click on this button down here. It says, Show Connection Design Pass-Through Forces. So I'll left-click on this. And in the data bar, which is where I would always refer people to when they switch tools, is just go to the data bar, make sure it's set up the way you want it to be. In the data bar here, we're going to look at the pass-through assembly method. And there's two different ways that we can do this. We have by design group name, which we'll look at in a little bit. And we have by pass member pass ID, which is what we assign to those joints or those member ends uh, in that last example. So I'm going to say by member pass ID, and then show me the pass-through force ID for uh, number one, pass ID number one. Remember, that was only assigned just around this one joint here in the model. And so if I zoom in on this and I can see every single degree of freedom is being reported, which is a little bit too much information at this stage. But I could then go to the uh, finer details in the data bar. I can say, look at the X direction forces only. And this is gonna show me the forces in the X direction, the orientation of those loads, and also the magnitudes. So here I can get an understanding for how much force is going into that connection. Same thing for the FY, FZ, and in my moments as well, we get an idea for how that looks. And we can always verify this. If we look at the FX direction, we can see, okay, well, this is obviously going to be uh, accumulating from the axial load in this member here, as well as any axial loads uh, that would be transformed into this X direction using trigonometry, and perhaps even any shear forces that might contribute as well, depending on the types of loading we're considering. And we could look at the axial forces in those specific members and get an understanding for what they equal. Uh, maybe I just want to look at the maximum forces. So you can see that we're getting about 15.5 uh, 
uh, or four or five kilonewtons of axial load within this horizontal beam. So that's really doing the lion's share of the contributing uh, to the FX forces in this specific joint. Now, if I go back to that same tool, I was just looking at uh, load case number one, but I could look at other situations as well, where maybe I want to look at load cases one through five. So I'm just going to change this load case uh, definition here from one to one through five. I could also just say all, and I'll click OK. And now it's going to show me a different set of results. And it may give me different results depending on whatever is contributing to this scenario. Uh, and I think I might have made a mistake somewhere along the way. I would expect that to at least maintain what we had before. Uh, so maybe don't put too much stock in the numbers right now. I think I might have made a mistake. Apologize in advance. But um, basically, what I was trying to do here is show that you can get an envelope. Uh, obviously, it's not working the way I intended it to. So I'll try to come back to that one later on. But while we're on this topic, I'll just go back to low case number one. And recall here that we also have uh, pass through force IDs assigned to these members, but they're different. So if I want to look at those contributions, I just change the pass through force ID to number two, and now I can see the results at this connection. And so I can see the same information, the axial force is contributing, uh, or I guess this would be the FX forces, not axial forces, and so on. Now this is all great because in this situation, if we look at the orientation of our x, y, and z axis, it lines up with the orientation of our structure. But you may notice here that I've got a separate model that actually has the same geometry and same loading, but I've just rotated it a little bit. So if I had the results with respect to the global x, y, and z, that wouldn't really align with where my connections would be designed for. The members connecting to one another aren't in that same orientation. But what we've done instead here, if I just switch to the geometry window, what we've done instead is we've defined a user coordinate system. We've got all these different user coordinate systems. And this one here has actually got uh, a rotation of 35 degrees. So if I select this user coordinate system, you can see that the orientation of this coordinate system is relative to the orientation of my structure. And we use this tool called the Joint Displacement Directions tool to basically tag specific degrees of freedom uh, on our joints uh, to a specific uh, joint. So we can change the orientation of a joint coordinate system based on whatever user coordinate system that we have. And our uh, results will be with respect to that. So I could then tag a specific joint with that orientation like we see here, and we'd end up with the results we'd expect in the orientation that we want. So I'm just gonna click Analyze again and reanalyze this whole model because I made that change to it. So I'm going to click OK. And now if I look at the results, and I want to look at the pass through forces results again with respect to the pass ID number one. Here I can see that I'm getting the same result now, uh, but the orientation of this load is now oriented with the actual member that's being assigned or the orientation of the the structure so it's aligning with that same member the beam here uh in the x direction which is what i would expect because i rotated the coordinate system of that joint and again if i didn't do that then this fx force would be offset by 35 degrees and probably wouldn't represent anything practical that we would use for this specific analysis I can view this information uh, not only graphically, but I can also view it numerically. If I go to the numerical results window here, I can see the results for connection pass through forces. And I can see for any single joint, uh, specific load cases that I may want to investigate. I can look at more than one if I want to. I can look at all load cases, for example. Um, and then I can look at the joints and the pass through force IDs contributing to that and what those actual values are. So this can be very useful for me if I want to see this information. Uh, I can filter it down to more uh, kind of finer details. If I want to just look at pass through force IDs number one, I can see those occur in a few different spots in my model for different load cases and some of those pass through force ID ranges as well. For all load cases, it's showing me this is the maximum in the X direction, the maximum in the Y direction, 
uh, Z and so on, and then the minimums as well. So maximum positive and maximum minimums, and it will give us a nice envelope. They may not necessarily all be occurring in the same low case in every scenario. There may be situations where this information that we see here isn't in uh, equilibrium because we have one low case that might be giving us our maximum Fy and a different low case might be giving a maximum Fx. But this will give us basically that summary of that whole range. Any questions so far? All right, if that's the case, then I'll keep moving. Feel free to interrupt me if there are any questions. I'm happy to, to answer them. But we'll continue moving on now. Uh, and we were talking about user-defined connection components, and that's basically what happens when you def tag individual member ends with those pass-through force IDs. So you have full control over the contributors to that connection. An example of this scenario would be like if you had a gusset plate at a joint, you can calculate the forces exerted on that gusset plate due to specific members that might be connected to it. And those can be summed up with respect to that joint's orientation and presented to you. And you can also look at the maximum and minimum forces reported for shared connection types. So let's look at the other scenario where we have automatically generated connection design components. And this is existing when S-Frame will automatically group members to form connection contributions. And you have to tell S-Frame to do this, but then it can go through every single joint, look at the members that are connecting in different directions, and sum up those members and basically do the automatic tagging of those pass-through force IDs. And you can always adjust it after the fact, but it will do this all, all this work for you. And it makes it easier to calculate pass-through forces for your entire model. If you're not just looking at individual members, it might be faster to use this method and then just fine tune it if you need to. And it's based off of the connecting members in each direction. So I'm using a screenshot here of that same member connection or member intersection uh, that we were talking about at the beginning of my last demo, where we have joint number one. And joint number one has several members connecting to it. But how this auto-generated connection design component will work is if you can imagine that we have a contact lens or just a hemisphere that is sitting at joint number one and it's facing the positive x-axis, it's going to basically assume that any member that's passing through that hemisphere is going to contribute to the positive x set of members at this joint. So if we look at this connection and we draw a hemisphere in the positive x direction, we can see that member 11, member number 1, and member number 31 all pass through that hemisphere. It will ignore any members that are completely uh, 90 degrees to that uh, connection. We would have to add those manually if we wanted it to. And again, you can override whatever it comes up with. So I'm going to go back to that same model now. And I'm just going to go to the geometry window again. But this time, in the Pass-Through Forces tool, I'm going to right-click on this tool. I'll just right-click, and it's going to open up this dialog here. And this will show me, basically, where all of our connection uh, contributing members will be listed. However, we haven't generated any of these yet. We can just click on the Generate button. Oh, and I think I might have some duplicate joint numbers, so I may have done something wrong there. I think that was related to what I had before, let me just quickly check the model here. This is one of the realities of doing these live presentations is sometimes things don't always go the way they did in rehearsal. Um, but I'm going to try this again here. Hopefully it works. If not, I'll maybe move along. Basically, my intention here is that it will generate all of these. And I think, again, I must have had done something wrong along the way. Uh, so I'll try to come back to that at the end if we have time. But it will look at every single joint in the model that has members contributing to it, and it will see which direction at member number one we have contributions from the positive side in the x direction. That group will be called positive x, and it will also have a tag of how many members are contributing. And then it will describe a 
suggested connection type. And this is just a suggestion only meant for uh, to give you some kind of detail in terms of what kind of connection might work. And that's determined based off the type of members that are connecting, the sections that are connecting, the releases that might be at that member and so on. However, again, it doesn't seem to be working as I had hoped to. So uh, again, I'll try to come back to that at a later time. In the meantime here, let's go back to uh, the slides. So if that was working the way I had hoped it to, uh, you'd be able to quickly and easily group your members that contribute to the connection. We can also specify connection types and custom group names. I mentioned the connection types already, so you can change those. You can make your own types of uh, connections as well, if those would work. And that will give whoever is consuming this connection design report afterwards more information in terms of what might be useful uh, when connect designing connection. They may already have a good idea, but it helps you at least understand what's going into it. And of course, you can control the contributing members just like you saw in that last uh, previous exercise. And I'll come back to this topic at the end, uh, but I do want to go through a calculation example here. And this is one that was actually passed along to me by a colleague uh, from a journal uh, that was published by the AISC. And it's an industrial structure. And it has both vertical and horizontal braces as two levels, and we have a 100 kip load on the top floor diaphragm. And on the bottom floor, we have an 80 kip load. Uh, so we have basically an 80 kip load that's being applied. And you can see this is a plan view. So what we're dealing with on the top floor, we have a diaphragm. And you can see on the bottom floor that we also have some horizontal bracing uh, and even some vertical bracing, as you'll see in the model. So this just gives you an idea of the layout of the elements, uh, the geometry that we're dealing with. So here I have three different bracing arrangements that are going to be considered with that geometry. So for A here, I have some diagonal bracing just on uh, the bays between lines two and three, but on both floors. For B, I have alternating sides. Uh, so at the top floor between Bays, bay lines one and two, I have uh, vertical, or sorry, bracing there. And between bays two and bay lines two and three on the bottom floor, I have bracing. And for C, you can see what we end up with there. So we have a nice continuous uh, line for bracing. So this is in the elevation view. And we're going to be comparing these different bracing arrangements. And what we're interested in for this specific example is looking at this one joint here within the model. We want to see the pass-through forces or the forces going through this joint uh, at, in the connection. So we have some loads here. Uh, we have some uh, loads on the top floor, one kip per foot. On the bottom floor here, these are the loads here. These are basically the forces entering the beams from the diaphragm and the horizontal bracing. So you can get an idea for what those are. Uh, and they've been transformed to the lateral uh, directions. So you can kind of get an idea for what each one of these represents. I won't go into too much detail describing it. Uh, I think the diagram will do a better job. And again, these are the forces that are entering our beams. And then we want to actually see the transfer or pass-through forces at the joints and the axial forces in the beams. And the ones that I'm interested in here are going to be uh, these ones. So FT equals 20 kips, 70 kips in B, and the same thing in C. So I'm just going to open up a model here that will have this information. So just give me one second to bring that open. So this is the model that represents uh, that structure that we just walked through. To explain it a little bit better here, uh, we've made some assumptions based off missing information from that uh, the journal article. Uh, so we've applied some specific sections to the model um, that you can see there. We've also, if I look at the, uh, if I go through a little bit further here, we have uh, some diaphragms 
So at the top floor, we have a diaphragm and the bottom floor, we have horizontal bracing. So it's a rigid diaphragm on the top floor. Uh, continuing on, if I look at the loads, we can see that we have one load case, 180 kips per frame. And those loads are as follows. So at the top floor, again, we're applying that 100 kip uh, load in the lateral direction to the diaphragm, which is going to distribute it to all the vertical elements. And on the bottom floor here, we've got uh, 40 kips applied to the center of each one of these bracing ranges. And if I just look at this from the head-on view, uh, we can see I'm looking at the XZ plane. We get reminded of what that uh, bracing pattern looks like in each scenario. So if I look at the geometry window again, I'm interested in looking at the pass-through force tool. And with the pass-through force tool, I want to see what exactly we have going into this. So here I'm just going to look at my pass-through force IDs. For number one here, we can see that we just have two members contributing. Uh, this is for the bracing frame, uh, bracing range in A. We have this beam and this brace tagged at the ends with pass-through force ID number one. Same thing for this arrangement. And if I just change my orientation, it might make this one a little bit clearer. For this one, we have going into this beam or this joint, we have a brace, a diagonal brace, a horizontal brace, and in the beam as well. So we actually have some extra members contributing. And I'm just going to run the analysis and observe some of the results. So I'll click OK to run the analysis, run a linear static analysis. We're getting a clean solution. And here we can look at some of the results in more detail. Uh, so let me start by looking at my axial force diagrams. I'm actually going to change how these are displayed. So I'm just going to change this from the, I call this the fill line diagram style. I'm going to change it to the line diagram style. Just to make it a little bit easier to digest. And now we can see the forces that are occurring at various locations. So we've got uh, forces entering this joint right here. I've got a lot of decimal digits, but I'll just leave that for now. But you can see the estimated forces in the braces, in the beams, so about 11, 13-ish. Um, and then also in this bracing arrangement as well. We've got some overlap because we've got braces on both sides, but you can get an idea for the magnitudes. Very close to what we were calculating in those hand calculations. And if I look at the show connection design pass through forces tool, specifically, I want to look again at the pass ID members uh, number one here. This is showing me that I get a force uh, passing through this connection of 20 kips in bracing arrangement number A, or bracing arrangement A, 70.001 kips, so effectively 70 kips in B, and exactly 70 kips in C. And just as a reminder here, if we go back to the transfer, uh, transfer forces at the joints slide here. We had 20 kips in A, 70 kips in B, and 70 kips in C. And it's worth mentioning as well, I should have probably put this slide beforehand. Uh, we also have con contributions from those vertical and horizontal braces. Uh, and this is just looking at an example from uh, the bracing option number two, or B it is, uh, in the vertical or the plan view and the elevation view. So those can't be ignored. We do definitely have some contributions coming from those braces, as you saw from the member force uh, diagrams that we're showing. So actually, while this is going on here, I just want to recap what we talked about. Um, we were looking at what our pass-through force is exactly. We tried to define that um, to set the tone for the rest of the presentation. We looked at pass-through force contributions. And uh, although I did make a mistake in that second demo, um, I'm going to show you in just a second what I was intending to show you there. And then we went through a calculation example where we had a literature example that we compared results to. I just have a few summarizing points uh, and then I'll open up the floor for you guys to ask any questions you might have. 
I'll also try to dig up the results uh, from that second example I tried to get working uh, so I can show you that as well. So just to maybe wrap things up here, you can see that we have a lot of control over which members are contributing to a specific connection. It's not limited to just whatever SRAM suggests or whatever members are contributing to a joint or connecting to a joint rather. We can automatically create pass-through force groups. And the members that are contributing to a specific uh, joint, or in this case, a connection component, those member and forces are going to be automatically transformed and then combined to establish design forces that are suitable for uh, that particular connection. And we can view this information both graphically or numerically, and we may have reasons to choose one or the other. So at this point, I'd like to open up the floor for questions. And while I'm answering, and uh, while you're, uh, while I'm waiting for the questions, sorry, I'm just going to try and find that other example model here. Just bear with me and feel free to ask questions. You can either type them or uh, if you have audio, you can always ask them uh, just by unmuting your line. And uh, I also have this model here that I wanted to bring up. Uh, so what I was intending to do here, if I just right click on the show connection design pass through forces tool, oh, sorry, that's the geometry windows where I meant to be, pass through force tool. We can see here that we actually have a list of every single joint where we have members connecting to. And these were generated for us by clicking the generate button. And it's going to, well, focus on joint number one, which is this joint here. Remember that when I showed that graphic in the PowerPoint slides, at joint number one, we had three members in the positive x direction that were contributing or connecting to it. Member number one, which was this horizontal beam right here. Member number 11, which was this roof brace. And member number 31, which was this uh, vertical brace. We didn't have any members connecting in the negative x direction. In the positive y direction, well, we had a few others and so on. But this is basically calculating for us every single joint the members are contributing rather than us having to go through and tag them all manually. Now we can always override it again, but it will give us a really good starting point, if nothing else. And it is also suggesting different types of connections based off of the members that are connecting in that direction. We can override this. We can create our own connection types if we'd like to, but it's not going to change how the member uh, or the um, pass-through forces are calculated, this is just a tag that might help identify some of this information. And we can change the group name if, you know, positive x3 members isn't descriptive enough for us. We have a lot of control over this information. So I didn't... Um, oh, sorry, there was a question? Sorry. Yeah, just a quick question, Matt. Mm -hmm. um, so in that previous window that you just had up, um, is there a way to find out in the model um, which one is uh, connection number one or two or three, uh, like graphically? Yes. So basically, it would all correspond to the joint number. That's why here we, we, the automatically generated names will include the joint number, like joint number one, for example. And the way to see that graphically is you just display your joint numbers. And I can see this is joint number one, three. I have two here, 21 there. Uh, so that would probably be the easiest way to, to see that information there. Yeah. And uh, what about when it comes to the pass through force IDs? Um, how do you know the order that they go in? Uh, in or terms do you assign that manually? Yeah, so that would be assigned manually. The pass-through force IDs here, like this drop-down list, is all assigned by the user. So the automated method doesn't use this numbering. Uh, this would be all a pass-through force ID one. So an example that I could think of is like, let's say that 
I, I want to make things simple for the, the detailer. Uh, and I'm going to assume that, uh, you know, I have, and this may not be a good example, but uh, I have a four bolt connection that has just a single beam on one side of my column. Uh, and I want the, I want to basically assign every single scenario where I have that four bolt connection with just a single beam coming to my column, that same pass through force ID number one. That means that throughout the whole structure, I might have 20 different locations where I have that pass through force ID number one. It can then calculate what's the worst case scenario throughout the whole structure and all the different low cases and combinations that this particular pass through force ID will come up against. And then that would be what you could use for design. Uh, that way you don't have to assign a different pass through force ID to every single connection, but you can make it more based off of constructability rather than the fact that you have, you know, potentially hundreds of different joints. You don't have to consider them all as unique connection design. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. And uh, just another quick follow up, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, so I can see there that there is an auto generate pass through force groups. Yep. Uh, so what does that do? That was that would do the exact same thing that I had tried to do in that uh previous cool. example and and failed it's the same thing as this generate button um mm -hmm. and so i've already done that for this model this is one i had already set up uh but basically it will scan the entire model all the joints and then it will figure out okay well these are the positive x members based off of joint number one which is this joint right here so there's three members this one this one and this one connecting mm -hmm. yeah makes sense yeah i just didn't know that they were the same no, no Same problem. Way. And you can always, again, I mentioned it, you can override it, but I didn't really show it. So let's just say here that for joint number one, we have a specific connection uh, that we don't want to include this horizontal or this vertical um, brace. That's member number 31. I could just say zero and get rid of it and it's no longer contributing. Uh, so this is fully customizable depending on what it is that you need. Uh, you can really get a lot of control over it. Is there a limit to the number of members that connect to a certain joint? Or um, that's a good question. I will check here. I think it says eight. Now, mm -hmm. if you use the pass through force ID method, then you would only be limited to how many joints you click or members you click with. So it could be a lot more than that. Um, but for this particular automated method, I think it's limited to eight. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. No worries. All right, if there's no more questions here, I just have a few upcoming announcements uh, that I'd like to make. Uh, as members of the Steel Squad, you guys are invited to attend any and all of our training classes free of charge. Uh, so next week, we actually have the Advanced Steel Design Training Course, P203. It's just a one-day course. It's on August 18th, which um, what day of the week would be Tuesday. Uh, so that's uh, happening next week. If you're interested, I encourage you to visit our website, sframe.com. Uh, you can contact us for the support link there. Uh, later on in the uh, fall, I guess you could say, after uh, September starts up, we have our Finite Element Applications F201 online training course. This would I say is less steel focused, more general analysis and finite element meshing focused. Uh, that's September 14th to 18th. Uh, later on that month, we have our nonlinear and P-delta analysis online training course. Uh, that's actually going to be preceded by uh, another lecture that I'm doing for you guys. That's on uh, P-delta and nonlinear analysis. That's on September 11th. Uh, and then we have some concrete focus courses uh, in November. So if you guys are interested in any of these, by all means, get in touch. I just recommend that you use your University of Alberta email uh, just so that we can quickly identify you and make sure that uh, it helps with our validation and so on. And if you have any questions, again, our website s-frame.com, you can contact us through there. It's probably the best way to contact us, although if you want to use email, that's fine as well. Um, if you have my personal email, you're welcome to contact me, uh, but just note that I am away from my computer at times. I may take vacation at times, so if it's urgent, I recommend either using our support email or contacting us through the website. That way someone else can respond uh, in my absence.
And you can follow us on any one of our other uh, social media platforms. We have great YouTube videos that we're always adding to. In fact, if there's any topics you guys would like to see, by all means, send those along. We're always looking for practical engineering content to add to there. And if there's any other uh, general topics that we support within our own software, uh, we're happy to elaborate on those as well. So feel free to get in touch. So that's it for me. Um, I'd like to thank you guys for your time. And if there are any questions, you know how to get in touch. Awesome. Thank you so much, Matt. No worries. Just would like to give a shout out to all our members. Uh, thank you for our members. Um, they're the reason we have the Steel Center and we can deliver these great presentations. And thank you to S-Frame as well for uh, delivering this presentation. And I just would like to remind everyone that you can find all of our upcoming Steel for Lunch presentations on our website or through Eventbrite if you search for Steel for Lunch. And next week's presentation is going to be delivered by our member Building Point about Tecla Structural Designer. So that's the same time next week.